developer, uh, developer wants a search bar to conduct the equipment searching that tells the submission. So when they want to submit some new data constraint, they can find whether there is any existing ones in the uh, data constraint repository equivalent to the ones they want to submit. And also, a quality assurance manager wants to divide the existing data constraint into several clusters. So this can guide the checking engine only to check one data constraint per cluster. So it can avoid the redundant checking process. And moreover, the cluster information can be forwarded to the developers to guide the further merge process. So in this work, we focus on the fundamental problem about the data constraint equivalence verification. That is, we have two data constraints, R1 and R2, as inputs. We want to design a decision process to check whether R1 is thematically equivalent to R2. So what we want to do is to design a decision process for our problem. So this is a very important component or important uh, procedure to uh, support the clients that is the uh, equivalent searching and clustering. But in real world, this problem is quite difficult. Firstly, we notice that there are tens of thousands of data constraints underlying the fintech systems. So such great number can amplify the efficiency, of efficiency bottleneck of our decision procedure. And also, an unsound or incomplete decision procedure can result in financial loss or hide the opportunity for optimization, respectively. But achieving these three goals simultaneously is quite difficult. So according to our investigation, existing effort can involve the term writing-based approach. It can ensure the soundness because the transformation process can ensure the thematic equivalence, but these lines of work can only discover a very restrictive form of the equivalent patterns and also suffer the huge overhead introduced by the vaster space when applying the right rules. And also we found that the SMT-based symbolic reasoning approach try to verify the equivalence by, uh, by de uh, determining whether they are logically uh, or the symbolic representation are logically equivalent. So it can ensure the soundness and completeness for the decidable fragment. But we should notice that the SMT solver is originally uh, proposed to solve the satisfiability problem instead of the logical equivalence checking. So it is not the best choice for our problem. And also, the solver itself has to be invoked thousands of maybe hundreds of thousand times so it can degrade the overall efficiency of our clients. So to address these technical challenges, our key ideas come from two important observations on the data constraints. Here are four examples. Firstly, we can notice that the data constraint in A and C must, must not be equivalent because they actually examine different attributes in the table named, uh, sorry, in, in this table, uh, T. So they have the different lexical uh, uh, features. So this can show that these two data constraints have the different restrictions on the tables named T. But on the other hand, we found that these two data constraints in the B and D are equivalent. After evaluating, symbolically evaluating the values of the user-defined variable, cache in the data constraint in D, we found that these two data constraints are almost the same, although they have some difference in terms of the commutative operands and the structures. So such isomorphic structures can help us determine the equivalence of these two data constraints. So based on such two important observations, we can get such insights. That is, we are likely to achieve a highly efficient decision procedure without very deep semantic analysis. Specifically, we can first leverage the lexical difference to guide the generation of the input, so that this two data constraint has a totally different behavior, so that we can achieve the over approximation of the original equivalence relation. And secondly, we can try to discover its amorphic structure underlying the data constraints, so that we can prove the equivalence efficiently so that we can achieve the under approximation. So in this way, although the original problem is uh, MP hard, um, very difficult problem, but we can still handle a large amount of real world instances in the polynomial time just to, uh, to solve the over approximation problem and the under approximation. So based on such insight, we can design our decision procedure EQ data in this way. Firstly, we can uh, conduct the semantic encoding 
to transform the data constraints to encode the automatics with two first of larger formulas as symbolic representations. So this is a very straightforward process. And then we leverage two lightweight analysis and then SMT solving to conduct equivalence reasoning. And these two lightweight analyses are the core technical contributions of our work. So I will give more illustrations here. Firstly, the divergence analysis try to concretize the data variables to make these two logical formulas evaluated to two different choose values. For example, if we want to enforce phi one, phi two in value to false and true respectively, we only need to focus some specific classes in these two formulas. So this can help us to discover this assignment to make phi one violated and phi two satisfied. So specifically, I want to mention that here, uh, we share some similarity uh, uh, with uh, direct in execution because we leveraged the lexical differences to explore some specific structures in this past tree. And similarly, we leverage the isom tree isomorphism algorithm to check whether these two past trees are isomorphic so that we can prove the equivalence in the linear time to the size of the, these first of logic formulas. And here are our theoretical results. Except for the SMP solving phase, all the uh, stages in our decision process can be achieved in the polynomial time to the size of the data, data constraints. And also, it is sound and complete if the data constraints belongs to a decidable fragment. Our approach has uh, been very effective to discover uh, over uh, about 26,000 equivalent pairs among the over 30,000 data constraints in our group and shows that we can safely remove 8,000 data constraints from the system. And we also observe that in the extreme case, in one equivalent cluster, there are about 48 data constraints in one cluster. And our approach can support the equivalent clustering efficiently because it can finish the analysis in just 2.89 uh, hours and the peak memory time cost are just linear and quadratic to the number of data constraints respectively. And also for the equivalent searching, the average time cost is only 1.22 seconds. So this can show the high efficiency of our approach to support these two clients. And we also do some ablation studies to demonstrate the necessity of our two lightweight analysis and the FC solving. To conclude, in this work, we formulate the problem of the equivalent data constraint verification and also propose a efficient, sound and complete decision procedure to support two important clients, that is equivalent searching and clustering, so that we have proposed a systematic solution to resolve the equivalent data constraint in fintech systems. Okay, that's all from my presentation. I'm glad to take some questions. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so I have one question. Uh, as you mentioned in the presentation, uh, in your system, in the, in the company, so there are tens of thousands of constraints that uh, uh, needs to do equivalence check. So does that mean that when there is a new uh, constraint uh, entered into the system, so this new constraint needs to be uh, check the for equivalence with all these tens of thousands of uh, uh, yeah, Yes, it's one of the um, using scenarios of our decision process. As I shown in this uh, workflow, actually uh, this is uh, related to the equivalent searching process because when we want to submit some new data constraint to the data constraint wrapper, we want to know whether it is equivalent to some existing ones. Otherwise, we, we may we, we can choose to merge it with the existing equivalent variance. So this is a very common usage in scenarios in the ARNT group. And also there are some existing work about the equi equational reasoning or the equational searching. So in this case, our approach can support a very strong guarantee that these two data constraints are semantically equivalent. So it can guarantee the uh, correctness of the, uh, of the, or we are not, introduce the financial loss because the necessary conditions still examined by the checking engine. Uh, I see, I see. So my impression is that, uh, I mean, of course, this is very, 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 very good work, very, it's great. My impression is that, uh, okay, for any new uh, constraint, you need to spend, I see the results, a few hours, it's still efficient. You need to spend a few hours checking the equivalence with the tens of thousands of uh, 
constraints in the, in the system. I'm wondering if there is some more efficient way or if there is any potential for more efficient way to, uh, to do this. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, there are several different technical choices, uh, for example, but basically if we have a new data constraint, mm -hmm. we needs to compare the new data constraint with the existing ones. Uh -huh. No matter uh, to some extent, maybe mm -hmm. we just compare the variable names or some features, mm -hmm. but it is uh, different. There are, there are different choices of technical design because sometimes we can check whether all the uh, table attributes really affects whether this, 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 this data constraint holds or not. So we can take such table attributes as a features. Mm -hmm. So if there is some new data constraint, we can just compare this table attribute directly. This mm -hmm. is also one of the technical choices. But in our approach, we just invoke our decision process as a black box to mm -hmm. check one by one. So, it, so you can see that in our evaluation, the equivalent search income has a, a linear time complexity. Yes. Yes. OK. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If no one wants to thank our speaker again. Oh, thank you. I am Shantu Rahman. I'm from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, today I'll present our work on TSVD4J. TSVD4J stands for Threat Safety Violation Detection for Java. Threat Safety Violation is a uh, situation when multiple threads try to access the shared memory locations, but due to some different thread interleavings, many of the crashes or some inconsistency data, uh, data we can get. So that is a problem. Let's assume one example from a project, Log4j. This assumes thread one executes the code block first, and the line two and three executes and it suspends its executions then. At that time, thread two comes and it tries to execute the same line of code and it gets the same values that thread one gets. But if the execution of thread one is different than this one, then thread two can, two can get different values for this appender list dot size. Suspension of our thread one happens after the line four, then the Thread 2 will get uh, appender list dot size as 0. Because the appender list is already, all the elements from this appender list is removed by the thread 1. So this is a value inconsistency that happens between these different runs. However, other consequences may also happen due to this thread safety violations issues, such as different crashes may happen. For example, thread one executes this line of code and it suspends its executions after line four. At the time, uh, at that time, if thread two comes and it enters into the uh, if block and it suspends its executions, what will happen if thread one uh, resumes back and it finishes its executions? At that time, if thread two comes back and tries to get the size of the appender list, the crash will happen. So this is one of the consequences of thread safety violations if it exists in our code. Hence, we need some tool that will automatically detect the thread safety issues in our code. We present TSVD4J, a tool to detect thread safety violations in Java applications. TSVD4J is developed on based on the TSVD approach, which is proposed by uh, Microsoft Research for C Sharp applications and that tracks only the API calls. However, in addition to that API calls, in this tool, we also keep tracks all the field accesses. And the TSVD4J reports a list of code locations that may conflict on accessing shared data across multiple threads. TSVD4J is implemented as a Maven plugin. In the architecture of a TSVD4J, we at first take Java bytecode as the input. We have one instrumenter. In the instrumenter, we keep track all the read and write operations, and then we dynamically replace all the invocations with uh, the proxy methods. For example, here line three and four has API method call. API call, so we convert this API calls into this proxy, and the implementation of this proxy is like this. Here we keep tracks the thread ID 
object ID and the operation types. Similar to this API tracking, we also keep track the field accesses. We convert this code block into this proxy and the proxy's implementation is exactly the same that I described before. Then we have one runtime analyzer. Uh, here we run the instrumented code with DLS, then we check all the read and write operations that occurs on the same data structure across multiple threads. And finally, we get a list of conflicting pairs. For example, uh, this is our instrumented code, thread one executes line four. At that time, we uh, try to, as it is a write operation, we suspend the executions of this thread and uh, we uh, we execute this trap and delay method that is in line six. And then uh, we, uh, we add that information into our trap table. In our trap table, we maintain the thread ID, the object ID and the operation type and the line number where that statement is. And uh, after that, we also allow another thread to execute and it when it executes line three, we find that the same object uh, is being accessed by the different threads. So when it goes in our trap table, we see that this line three and four are conflicting pairs and we report that line three and four as conflicting pairs. We evaluate our result on 12 open source projects, six are taken from benchmark dataset, uh, and uh, we found that we, uh, in our TSVD4J, uh, 55 conflicting pairs we got, and uh, by tracking only the field access, we got 45 uh, conflicting pairs. So uh, in, from our observation, we can say that tracking the fields is very important, at least for the Java applications. Our tool is available in this link. Feel free to contact with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, um, did you compare your approach to different tools like JFP uh, and others? Yeah, I compared uh, our result with the RV predict and the result is this one. Okay. So yeah, like uh, we compared our result with RV predict and we found that RV predict can get 17 conflicting pairs where we got 55 conflicting pairs. Yes, okay. Any other question? One more quick question. Okay, let us thank our speaker again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Achia, and yes, uh, this paper was uh, presented in uh, IEEE Transaction of Software Engineering. Um, so Sapir and Wolf's uh, hypothesis say that language determines thought. And all computer languages were inspired by this hypothesis, designed to direct programmers to adapt their thinking to the way machines think. And there are many examples for that. However, modern linguistics um, uh, agree now that languages influence only certain cognitive processes in non-trivial ways. And a, a non-linguistic researcher called Deutscher uh, say that when language routinely obliges you to, to specify certain types of information, it forces you to be attentive to certain details in the world. And he gives an example of this sentence. I spent yesterday evening with a friend, and if I'd said it in English, you may be wondering whether it was a male or a female. But then again, if I said in, in English, in a, I'm sorry, in French or German, I'm obliged uh, to specify the exact gender by the grammar of the language. So why am I talking about grammar and English? Um, so I'm going to demonstrate how Petrinet uh, routinely obliges uh, oblige users to specify things they do not wish to specify, and that exactly this results in unexpected behaviors and undesired uh, uh, behaviors. Um, what you see here is a known benchmark. Uh, it is old, it's 35 years old, and yet it is still very popular. It was cited and used in papers uh, 45 times last year only. And nevertheless, you'd be surprised to hear that we found several bugs in it that no one has ever detected. And here's one of them. After the first train passes, 
the barriers, and before the second train arrives, the barriers are raised and lowered twice just for fun. And the question is, why is it happening? So on the left, you see the requirements of this uh, model, and you can see that the two middle requirements, implementation is all over. It is hard to say uh, which state and transition is in charge of which behavior in the, in the right model. And in PetriNet, and actually in any imperative language, programming language, you cannot separately implement um, uh, each requirement or aspect of behavior and then expect everything to work together. You need to explicitly specify how to combine these things together. Um, and this mess is part of the reason for the bug and also for not detecting uh, uh, this bug. And we actually proved that in the paper. And so our first lesson learned is that programming and modeling languages should allow us to align each behavior or requirement to a single mo module in the, in the specification or, or the computer program. But the interesting, interesting part, though, is the last requirement that says that something must not happen. But how do we say that something must not happen in programming languages or in Petrinet? And the answer is, as before, you simply specify many uh, modules that say what should happen, and then you explicitly specify the combination mechanism for interweaving them together. Um, and again, this solution had side effects of, of incorrect specification and behaviors. Um, so this is our second lesson learned, that languages should allow us to explicitly spe specify what must not happen uh, in our uh, program and the scenarios. And so we have this um, uh, uh, understanding that Petrinet uh, obliges users to specify the combination mechanism that is not specified in the requirements, and that this, uh, ex exactly this combination mechanism causes these bugs and uh, undesired behavior. And we also find that aligning modules to, requir to requirements, including anti-scenario, is a key for solving this problem. And to prove that, we compared Petrinets to a model-driven engineering paradigm called behavioral programming, or just BP. And the main design goal of BP is that requirements and the specification and the program would look exactly the same. And we achieve that by aligning each requirement into a single scenario or anti-scenario. And then during runtime, we have an execution engine that takes all these scenarios and executes them into a cohesive behavior that is aligned with all the requirements. Um, and so we showed that BP modelers are not obliged to specify anything except for the requirements themselves. And using model checking, we've, we compare the state space of the two programs, and of the two uh, state space of the two, and, and we prove that the faulty behavior in Petrinet is indeed caused by the um, combination mechanism. This is just a simplified uh, representation. Um, and we also show that uh, um, while BP maintains the same uh, mathematical characteristics as Petrinet, um, it provides means for dynamically changing and adapting the uh, uh, model, thus increasing the, its agility. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, any questions? I agree with everything you said. It's really difficult to transform things into Petrinets. Um, but do you have any suggestions on how to combine them uh, without forgetting behavioral effects? So um, I, I think the key, you, you mean in different programming languages, not specifically in Petrinet? So, um, the idea, so, so basically the idea of behavioral programming, for example, is that you don't need to do the translation. You just think about requirements and you translate. It's, you don't need to translate. The, the, each requirement is, uh, uh, can be viewed as a, a single thread of action uh, that is scenario or anti-scenario. So there's no real translation. It looks really the same. Um, and then the, the work is done behind by the execution engine. Um, and, and indeed, it's, it's, uh, it's a completely change in the, in the way we program, but um, personally, I think that um, for years we tried to, to adapt programming languages or ourselves to programming languages, and I think we've come to the state that there are alternatives 
that allow us to, to program differently. And it's actually uh, proved in, uh, we, we, we use it also in industry projects and it's actually uh, working. Okay, thank you, thank our speaker again. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm De Hui Du, coming from East China University. I'm very glad to have the uh, chance to present our recent work about a novel and uh, pragmatic scenario modeling framework with verification in the loop for autonomous driving system. It's a joint work with my students. And uh, here we, uh, we have five parts in this uh, pretension. First, let's see the, uh, our motivation. For autonomous uh, driving system, we call it ADAS is typical safety critical system. It requires intensive evolution of safety before they came out to the market. However, uh, the field testing is practically infeasible as a result. The focus is shift to scenario-based testing in a virtual environment. So the scenario is very critical for simulation testing and verification for ADAS. But uh, how to describe or model this driving scenario is a challenging problem. So we want to have this uh, scenario, scenario modeling and uh, the tool to support this uh, uh, scenario description. Um, before I go to the details, let's see the existing work for scenario description language, uh, such as Open Scenario. It's uh, a some standard scenario describe language with XML format, and also G Scenario. It's a language for scenario representation built on Open Street Map, and there is also Scenic. It's a probabilistic program language for modeling the environment of a physical system. And also, we have proposed our language. It's a, a kind of scenario modeling language. It's different uh, with this related work. So we want to simplify the description of scenario in a user-friendly manner and allows modeling statistic behavior of vehicles. And also, it has the formal semantics for verification and allow generating the concrete scenario in a simulator. Uh, if you are interested, you can see the details uh, of this work in our paper uh, in the conference ASE. And I will skip this part. And here we just uh, see a brief uh, model of our language. This is a class diagram, and it defines the syntax of our language, and including the uh, stake uh, element in scenario and the dynamic behavior of our agent. And uh, here we give the overview of our approach. There are three parts. First is the uh, MDE for our language. We apply the model driven uh, technique to implement uh, scenario modeling language. Where we have the abstract syntax, concrete, and also the operation semantics. It actually uh, base, uh, support this uh, a verification in later. And the second part is we want to simulate our models. So we have the uh, scen scenario executor. It's a model based. Uh, it can run this uh, scenario model in various uh, simulator. And then you can also modify and uh, uh, verify your models with the model checker WPSMC to do the qualitative and quantitative analysis. So this is the three parts of our contribution. Uh, first is scenario modeling approach with uh, the mod, uh, MDE technology, and also the scenario executor. And the final is the verification in the, in the loop. And uh, for simulation, here we just give you a very uh, simple example about our uh, executor. Uh, here we we want to use this executor uh, to respond for orchestrating the dynamic behavior process of multiple vehicles in the simulator. And also we abstract the common aspect of uh, various popular simulator, such as color and casting. And uh, then you can use the uh, WUPO SMC to verify our models uh, to uh, evaluate the probability of this uh, 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 control strategy of the vehicles. So I will give you an example about that. Uh, this is the 
a uh, uh, very simple example. There are two cars. Uh, green one is the uh, F1, and uh, here is the Agro car, the red one. And uh, for F1, it goes along the road for five seconds and stops suddenly. But we assume that the Agro car can choose to change line to the left, or maybe it can slow down to come to a complete stop. So we want to model, model this scenario in our language. So you can use our tool. This is a snapshot of our tool. And you can cu uh, customize the uh, default configuration with your car. And uh, importantly, you can add the vehicle uh, with the uh, new vehicle button. And you just import uh, the vehicle scenario model. So it's uh, support to reuse the vehicle model. And also, you can define different uh, operations with your uh, scenario. So it's kind of a static uh, um, position, uh, modeling for this scenario, and then you can modify it. And the difficult part is the probabilistic behavior of the vehicle. We have the different way to support to model this model, uh, the behaviors, and then you can uh, simulate uh, in your color, in color. And uh, you see for the left one, we have uh, the, the Black one, it can choose to deliver And the red one, it can change the line to the left. So we have the scenario result. And also we have the overtaking scenario. The same, you can define your model and get your simulation result. Finally, you can use OPSMD. This is a hybrid static automat in, of our ego car. So you can do this verification result with the model checker. Uh, such as uh, uh, if you want to know what's the probability that the agro car use the uh, uh, land change strategy to complete overtaking, so we can get the evolution result. The probability of this agro uh, overtaking the internal is between uh, zero to zero point nine and uh, zero point eight. This is uh, evolution, and finally we <laughs> want to. Uh, extend our modeling element, and uh, we want also construct the EDAS scenario repository to explore and store the generated image and the scenario models to support training and the evolution machine learning framework. Yeah, that's all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. So if you want to uh, try our example and our tool, you can uh, check this uh, GitHub, and also you can we, we can discuss offline, it's okay, yeah. Any questions? I have a quick one, maybe just for clarification. Hmm. So uh, in your work to model the vehicle's behavior, so which model did you use? It seems to be some tree structure, I see. You mean this model? Uh, no, if you go back. Yeah, I see this tree structure, so for modeling the vehicle's behavior? Yes, very, uh, yes, exactly. Actually, we create the tree structured behavior models to model the uh, statistic behavior of agent because we don't know. We, we only can control the ego car uh, behavior. We can't control the car uh, beside the, uh, the ego car. So uh, there are a lot of uncertain behavior. So we choose this kind of like this uh, uh, this uh, point you see here, the dot uh, dot arrow. So we can use it uh, to model the discrete uh, probabilistic. Uh, it will choose uh, left uh, left uh, change line, or maybe it will choose with some probability to just stop, or maybe something like that. So actually, we uh, for now we are um, going on this work. We want to modify this tree like tree structure behavior because if. Uh, it's a long time, you see, maybe the tree model will be very huge. So we want to modify it, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> One more quick question, yeah. Uh, thank you, it's a very impressive work. So uh, I see you use UFO, so I suppose uh, you use yeah. uh, time automata as yeah, if, uh, like back this end. One. I'm just wondering how you could add a probability into it, uh, since I'm not familiar with this. Uh, oh, okay, work. so. Uh, for the uh, classical WUPO, it's just the time automata, yeah? But for WUPO SMC, here we, we use the new version of WUPO MSC because this work is a joint work with uh, the WUPO confounder 
uh, the founder, uh, Kim Larson, actually we work, we, we, we work in uh, one team. So we have the new version of this uh, WUPO to, uh, model checker. Uh, it's called uh, WUPO SMC. If you, can, if you are interested, you can um, check in this uh, uh, demo. And uh, here you can see. For this, this is a hybrid static scale automata. It's extended based on time automata. So for here, you, we have this, uh, let me check. Uh, you can define these uh, behaviors with the, uh, something like the uniform, a uniform distribution with a time interval. So it's a, it's the uniform, and also you can have exponential distribution. Uh, so the, the new code supports that. So you can have model the statistic behavior, and also we have a hybrid behavior because we want to use it to model the CPS. The Cyberbase system it has a continuous behavior. So this is a new version of Google. You can try it. <laughs> mm. Okay, let us thank our speaker again. Yeah, thank you. And this concludes our session. I hope you all enjoy it. And uh, I hope that launch is also outside. So thank you all.